there was a woman who was beautiful, who started with all the advantages, yet she had no luck. She married for love, and the love turned to dust. She had bonny children, yet she felt they had been thrust upon her, and she could not love them. They looked at her coldly, as if they were finding fault with her, and hurriedly she felt she must cover up some fault in herself. Yet what it was that she must cover up she never knew. Nevertheless, when her children were present, she always felt the center of her heart go hard. This troubled her, and in her manner she was all the more gentle and anxious for her children, as if she loved them very much. Only she herself knew that at the center of her heart was a hard little place that could not feel love, no, not for anybody. Everybody else said of her, she is such a good mother. She adores her children. Only she herself and her children themselves knew it was not so. They read it in each other's eyes. Click. Done did clicked it. Done clicked it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's really loud. <laughs> Let me turn this down down there we go i was like blowing out the top of the, the thing it was like way <laughs> off the charts yeah let's not do that yeah that stunk uh, <laughs> willow phil are you a rocking horse winner i used to have a rocking horse it was kept in the porch yeah where did yeah. you get said rocking horse i don't know i was that was when I was like three. And you would know better than I would. Was it like an actual rocking horse? Yeah. Like a full on rocking horse? Yeah. I don't you remember sat on that. It and you rocked back and forth. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> As you rock side to side, it wasn't I a guess. a fake rocking horse. I don't even know what that means. It was what? It wasn't a fake rocking horse. I don't even know what that means. A fake rocking horse is like a rocking horse that doesn't actually rock, I guess. Yeah. That's just a horse. <laughs> What do you know about D.H. Lawrence? Uh, I know that you were making fun of his name last time. I wasn't making fun of his name. I was confusing him intentionally with T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Same thing. Yeah. He uh, <laughs> he wrote Sons and Lovers, uh, Women in Love, Lady Chatterley's Lover. He was censored a lot, considered a pornographer by many. Uh, yeah, I remember this from last episode. Yeah, he was born in 1885. He died in 1930. He died at the age of 44. Like the guy, the guy had a had a very short life. Um, uh, his last work was a reflection on the Book of Revelation called Apocalypse. Uh, he died. I don't know. I can't even figure what he died of. Tuberculosis. He died Everyone of, dies of tuberculosis in the end. Yeah, he dies of... You know what? What? Given the way that this story was written, that makes sense. Yeah. This is a story that if it was longer, somebody would have died of tuberculosis in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so he didn't write much as far as uh, like spooky stories went. He wrote a few spooky stories. Um, but according to, according to our boy, uh, uh, David G. Hartwell of, of the Dark Descent fame, he, uh, wait a minute. Why are we talking about this? Because we want to. Why do we want to? Because it's fun. Who are we? I'm Willow. And I'm Phil. And And it's it's El Toro Toro time. time. That was back. We did that all backwards. Yeah, we did. (laughs) Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, we did that all backwards. But this is Del Toro time. It's Del Toro time. But we are covering The Dark Descent by J.V.G. Hartwell, a bunch of short stories, because we want to read a bunch of short stories and talk about them. That's yep. it. What is the Medusa in the Shield? Uh, psychological horror. Right. It is the second book of the book, The Dark Descent. We're covering psychological horror, a horror that is a dark reflection of ourselves. This week, it is D.H. Lawrence's The Rocking Horse winner. What does David G. Hartwell have to say about D.H. D. Lawrence and the Rocking Horse winner? Uh, well, not much. 
It's, it it talks about how the story uses the form of the possessed child tale, mm-hmm. which it does. Um, he talks about uh, how this was written during. And this is a quote from him. Yeah, this was written during the era when the modernists had, for the most part, assumed the death of the supernatural tale in the mainstream of literature. So. There you go. A tale outside of its time, I guess. Uh, but also it kind of avoids any any uh, supernatural explanation Yeah. for what happens in this story. it You can't say it was all in the boy's head. No. Because the boy clearly has some sort of ability. But if he wasn't able to do what he can do, this whole story would seem like a boy slowly going nuts because of the pressure of his parents' financial woes. I mean, you can debate that that's exactly what this is. Right. Because it's not like the ability works all the time. He Mm -hmm. just gets lucky sometimes. That's true. That's true. But he does seem to know when he's right. Yeah. Uh, He also, uh, there's a strong, and I read a few essays on this story, there's a strong sexual component to this, like a psychosexual component, Mm -hmm. in the sense that his riding of the horse, his leaving the nursery, him becoming an older kid is like sort of very parallel with like burgeoning sexual feelings in a child. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's also that. And and this being a D.H. Lawrence novel, people are going to read that into it much, much more than that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, uh, uh, David G. Hartwell calls this a small masterpiece of modern literature. And I really liked this story. Yeah, I did too. It's weird. It bizarre. And sad. Like, it's really sad. No one's really a bad guy in it. They're just struggling. Yeah. Um, and you, at the center of it, you've got this, like, Sort of like just nice kid who gets overwhelmed by the needs of the adults in his life. Yep. <laughs> and filthy lucre. I don't know what that means, by the way. Uh, dirty money. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so what is this story? Roughly, what is this story about? The story is about a kid named Paul. Uh, he speaks like the meme of a Victorian child. Mm-hmm. Um, which is incredible and I love. (laughs) He is a member of a a family living beyond their means, essentially. Yeah. Um, It doesn't seem like they're poor, necessarily. Like, if they they didn't overspend, they would live, like, a comfortable life. Yeah. But they keep trying to keep up appearances because it seems like their families might be rich. Yes, they are um, the they are the unwealthy branch of the family. Yeah, but they don't want to be a, like appear that way. Right. Um and the the sort of uh thread throughout the story is the idea the concept of luck. Um it it actually starts off you think that the main character is going to be a woman. Uh cuz it starts off sort of from her perspective, her third person perspective. Yeah. Um but it quickly transitions into being about Paul. Uh, basically, he's this kid who lives in this household, and the tone of the house, uh, ke- the house keeps whispering, we need more money, basically. Like, more money is needed. And the kids are feeling the pressure, but no one ever talks about it. And when you say the and, house is whispering, the house is literally whispering this. Yeah, like, it's it's just this this constant babble of we need more money yeah um and one day paul talks to his mom he's like hey what is like what the why why are we why don't we have a car (laughs) basically yeah and she's like well because we don't we don't have we don't have 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 money (laughs) he's like but why though she's like because we're unlucky and he's like "Mm, i'm lucky and she sort of brushes him off as you do kids And he sets out to prove it, and he starts riding this rocking horse, and the rocking horse appears to allow him to uh, predict horse race winners. Yeah. Um, And he starts up this sort of partnership with the family 
gardener? Yeah, like gardener handyman named Bassett. Yeah, named Bassett, which is an awesome name. Who used to be his uncle Oscar's batsman Yeah, in the military. Um. um and they start winning money, but the kid doesn't want to tell anyone. Uh, he's trying to save up his money for his, his family to hopefully stop the whispers. His uncle finds out and joins in with it all, and they start making money. Um, and then eventually, this like big derby comes up after the kid hasn't been able to predict anything for a while, and he starts getting really stressed. And one night, his mother comes home after he's been sick. Mm -hmm. and sees him riding the rocking horse furiously, and he starts yelling the name of the horse that's going to win, and then the next morning he dies. Yeah. But he wins. He wins. He wins 80,000 pounds. Yeah. Which, I don't know when this takes place. But even if it takes place con in the contemporary... Uh, yeah. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, it, it's a... It's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, 80,000 pounds today is a lot of money. Yeah. For a family, for a boy to win, for like an eight-year-old boy to win on the and, horses. And that's in addition to all of the other money he had earned as well. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to look it up. 80,000 pounds in, what year was this published? 19... 1926. So 80,000 pounds in 1926. That's right before the Great Depression, too. Oh, wait, no. This is pounds. So they wouldn't have gone through that. Is the equivalent of 1,381,654 pounds today. Damn. So this kid is a millionaire. Uh... And or he's made his family millionaires. But mm -hmm. one thing they point out is the more money he earns, the louder the whispers actually get. Yeah. Uh, as it goes along. And because at one point he 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 wins 5000 pounds and sets it up so that his mom can get a thousand pounds on her birthday for five years. Yeah. And she's like, I need all of that money now to help me get out of debt. Yeah. Which is questionable i feel like that was sort of the implication like she actually just wanted the money because she starts spending extravagantly yeah yeah um it's that whole like this kid is trying to help his family get out of the hole that they've buried for themselves and now they're just digging it deeper using the resources that he gives them R right um because because he doesn't understand like he doesn't he's a little child mm -hmm. so he does oh i'm sorry uh i was accidentally looking up dollars uh that's the equivalent of six million two hundred and fifty six thousand pounds today holy crap yeah that's an increase of seven thousand seven hundred and twenty percent so <laughs> so they're millionaires and yeah the more he doesn't understand anything about money he basically says that like i don't mm -hmm. i don't I don't know anything about money. He just knows that you need it and that if if you have, if you make money, that means you're lucky. That's the whole thing about this. His mother tells him that she's unlucky because she's married to a man who's unlucky and that it doesn't matter if you have money. If you're unlucky, you'll lose money. But if you're lucky, you'll make money. Like, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's no good to have money if you're unlucky because you just lose it. And it doesn't matter if you don't have money if you are lucky because then you will get money. And that's what gives him this idea because he finds out, he hears that he's lucky. Mm -hmm. And so he would, he'll ride the rocking horse furiously and say, what does he say? He's like, I'm trying to get to the place where luck is or yeah. something like that. So he's actually going somewhere like yeah, metaphysically. Uh, to get these answers. It's weird because if you see the whole thing as just symbolic, it's just a kid who's driven nuts by his parents, driven to death by his parents, yeah. like the stress of trying to make his family happy, which mm -hmm. metaphor taken. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> um, the kid who's trying to hold his family together. But if you take it literally, there's weird stuff going on in this. 
Yeah. Uh, the horse. What is this horse? <laughs> yeah. The horse talks to him. He gets it for Christmas. The horse is like, you got to have more money. Hop on and I'll take you to the answers. Um, Because it works. <laughs> I love his relationship with the guard. Like you keep, or I kept thinking that the twist was going to be that he was somehow going to get like cheated out of his money or someone would tell on him or he'd get caught out and lose the big bet. I thought that was going to be it, but no, like the gardener's a stand up guy. Bassett's like, Mm -hmm. I'm here to help out. Like I, you, you tell me what to bet on and I'll bet on it. His uncle finds out and is like, this is amazing. Yeah. I'll keep this a secret. And when he's like, I need to give this money to my mom, but she won't accept it. If I give it to her, his uncle's like, don't worry. I'll set it up with her lawyer. I'll tell him to say that it's from a deceased, distant relative put into a trust. Like everything, everyone helps him out as much as he asks. <laughs> if only that child had been allowed to move in with his uncle. <laughs> his uncle Oscar, who, yeah, it's a, uh, it's an interesting family dynamic. Like the, the mother works, she gets a job, mm-hmm. um, but doesn't earn nearly enough money. You don't really know if she's not earning enough money for them to live or if she's not earning enough money for her wants. Yeah, because the both of the parents work. Um, yeah. It says they make a small amount of money. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, yeah. It was. It was the mother had a small income and the father had a small income, but not nearly enough for the social position which they had to keep up. So it seems like they have enough money to live, just not enough money to pretend right it's 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 similar to what we talked about in the past with people who are house poor um but they're not really yeah they're not really house poor they are just living beyond their means you see it a lot in modern days oh yeah like influencers and stuff and it makes sense because because they are the poorest people in their family yeah and they're embarrassed by their station and it's it's like yeah, like Victorian era England. Um, is so nineteen twenties Victorian era? Is it Victorian era? Um, Victorian era. Uh, no, it For, it is a uh, what's is it Edwardian? Yes, you're right. It's the yeah. Edwardian era. Um, so forgive me, listeners, for getting that wrong. Yes, it's the Edwardian era. No, it's not the Edwardian era. No, that was it was because that only goes until nineteen ten. Yeah. Uh, Edwardian era. Georgian era. Oh, it's It just says it's not commonly called the Georgian. No, that's not the Georgian era. That's the 1800s. I don't know because it just says after. Oh, because after that, it's the First World War. Yeah. So, so it's, it's World War One era. Yeah. World War One era. Uh, uh, yeah. England. Uh, presumably post-war because World War One World War only went to 1918. It's, yeah, but that, okay. that, that's why Bassett is the guy's former... Former batsman, you're right. So yeah, this is, so post-World War One, pre-World War II. The, it's called the interwar period. I just looked it yeah. up. This is, this is interwar era post... Kind of when everything was booming. No, everything is tense. Every, no, everything is tense. I... I hate modern history. Everything I'm is booming because of all the bombs. Yeah. <laughs> no, the bombs and I don't I don't know. I don't like the world wars. I think they're boring. The world wars are not boring. Uh, they're just very complicated. So uh, this is the interwar period. Welcome to the interwar period in England. Um, yeah. So they just had a devastating world war. Everyone's shell shocked. Uh, they are, we are, we are a couple of, a, a few years away from the next world war where everyone will give him more shell shocked. And like, yeah, cause, have, uh, because Bassett, the batsman is injured. Like he has a, he has a leg injury from the war. Um, yeah, things are, things are all over the place. And, but it's kind of that post Edwardian thing. Like they're still trying to keep up appearances in that way. That whole British stiff upper lip thing. Right. Okay, sorry. I'm st- I go for it. I had to look up. So, it's I have a theory about the parents' wealth. Okay. Um, so 1920s in America, things were kind of like looking up. Yeah. Uh, roaring 20s, blah blah blah. In Britain, however, it was the complete opposite. Um, their economy took a massive hit. 
um, their trade and industry was ruined. And that was what made them decline as the world's biggest economic power. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I have a feeling that the parents probably used to be wealthy. Yeah. But they lost everything during the war and they don't know how to cut back anymore. Right. Um, that's a good that's a good perspective on this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the because, whole uh... because that adds a whole other layer to the like crushing burden of their unstable, like unstable economic situation. <laughs> right. Uh, the father is barely a character in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just know that the mom doesn't seem to respect him. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the the three main, the four main characters are Paul Bassett. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here as well with like class. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bassett is lower class, uh, so he's a gambler. The uncle's a gambler as well, but he's a gambler through a club. Like there's this whole thing yeah. about the uncle's club. Uh, the uncle has a lot of money. The mom doesn't. And these are all themes and character traits that are expanded upon in the 1949 movie, The Rocking Horse Winner, uh, Mm -hmm. which I watched yesterday. It's on, I found it on archive.org. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a fantastic movie. It is literally, it is, this story took you how long to read? 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. It took me a little longer. I'm not as fast a reader as you. But it's a, it's a short story. It's quick. It's just like it just hits the point. It's got a lot of cool dialogue in the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, these conversations, like sort of philosophical conversations between characters. But uh, the movie barely embellishes the plot. It s- expands that story out without like a whole lot of indulgence. Uh, mm-hmm. You see him, you see the boy meet Bassett. Bassett gets higher. You see that happen for the first time. It's kind of where you learn his history. Uh, you spend a lot more time with the father. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it is super faithful and super just kind of just fleshes out these problems they all have. I think in the in the movie, the father loses his job eventually. Yeah. Uh, he's also you find out he's a ga- he he goes to, he plays cards poorly. Yeah, because his his mother in the story talks about family history with gambling and yes. how it's like ruined people. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. uncle uh, in the movie goes on about how he has loaned a lot of money to them. Yeah. Uh, to his sister and gives her a final loan and it's like this is your last loan and and you see Paul overhear a lot of these conversations mm-hmm. and that's causing him all this stress. The rocking horse in the movie is terrifying. Uh, <laughs> it looks like something from a Conjuring film. Hell yeah. Um, but pretty- also it's not. I was thinking like a rocking horse like on treads like the yeah. on rockers. Mm-hmm. But it's actually one of those in the movie because I was like, how does a boy this big? He's going to look ridiculous on a rocking horse. It still goes back and forth, but it's more one of those like glider horses. It's like suspended. Oh. Um, like on, like, so it's still on that, rails. That makes sense because uh, they talk about how the toys are like, in, like, are like luxury. Yes. <laughs> like yes. The, this wouldn't be just a simple wooden rocking horse that you, like this is a rich person rocking it's horse. It's a rich person rocking horse. And he, in the movie, he makes poor Bassett like haul it around. <laughs> and you see Bassett, who can, who has trouble walking, carrying this gigantic rocking horse like up the stairs. As the boy's <laughs> like, "Come on, come on!" Uh, the boy who is played by John Howard Davies, who we saw in Oliver, he played Oliver, yeah. and he looked the whole time. I was like, "Who is this boy, and why do I know him?" <laughs> He's, I think, a little bit older. Mm-hmm. But he still just looks like uh, if you remember, I don't know if you remember the episode. John Howard Davies didn't do many films. He yeah, he only acted through his childhood, and then he like went on to be a business person. I think he started directing eventually. Uh, but he's just as good. This movie, he's mm-hmm. great in. The mom is played by Valerie Hobson, who yep. we saw as adult Estella in Great mm-hmm. Expectations. Yeah, so because I was watching, I was like. Dang, his mom is pretty. <laughs> like, <laughs> man, you got a beautiful British actress to put. Oh, it's Estella. Like, yep. <laughs> and she still has that like sort of coldness, but like sort of mm-hmm. loveliness. She does a really good job. None of the characters in the movie are unlikable. Like, you you feel sympathy for all of them. Like, they do stupid things. But uh, I was also because I'm used to American adaptations. I was expecting the ending to be changed. 
Yeah. I was like, there's no way they're killing the kid off. Like, but they do. He rides yeah. that rocking horse like crazy. He falls off. The only thing they do is they add an ending. Um, at the end of the short story, they're like, probably for the better that he died instead of just winning horse races because of this rocking horse. They say that in the movie, but then it goes on. Bassett takes the rocking horse outside and burns it. He sets it on fire. So yeah. it's burning. And then he looks up and the mom is standing there and she's holding this cash box. Oh, he has a cash box full of their winnings that he gives to the mom who's standing there. And she looks at it, starts crying, and she's like, burn it. Burn all the money. Uh, I don't want it. I don't want this. This is my son died for this money. I don't I can't touch it. Mm-hmm. And I thought that it was going to end with them burning all the money. But what I loved was that it was very conscious of its era. It was very conscious of its characters. Bassett says, no, uh, if you don't want this, I can think of a lot of good things this money can do. Mm -hmm. I can personally think of lives this money can save. Your son may have died, but the money he died getting can save some lives. And I think that's worth hanging on to this. And he puts it away and he takes the money with him. Uh, And I was like, oh, right. She's still delusional enough to not Mm -hmm. realize that she is as poor as Bassett. Yeah. And by rejecting the money, it's like, you're going to lose everything. Like You need this money. You've already spent all your money. You need it. The boy knows you need it. And Bassett's like, fine, if you won't take it, not I'm going to keep it, but I'm going to use this to help people because that's what he was trying to do in the first place. Yeah. I mean, Bassett probably doesn't even need the money because he's also been betting his own money. I remember thinking that. And then they emphasize in the movie, and it's something that sort of hinted at in the book, because a good year, year, 18 months goes by of mm-hmm. them betting. The last few months, they've been losing everything. They right. can't win. Uh, he's that's why he's so stressed out about picking a winner for the Derby because the Derby is huge because mm-hmm. he's picking winners that aren't just winners. They're like 10 to one odds. And he's de- They're desperate to find out who's going to win the Derby because the odds are so big on some of the lesser known horses. And uh, and they also haven't been winning much. Right. So, okay. yeah. So you've got this. They always hold money in reserve, but. I think that they kind of need that cash. Okay. That makes Um, sense. Yeah. So I suggest, I highly recommend checking the movie out to anyone listening. It's an hour and a half long. It's brilliantly done. The, the rocking horse sequences are trippy as all get out. They do a good job at like showing just the weirdness of it. And everyone's just really good in it. It also make a really good play. It probably has been adapted to a play. I don't know, but, uh, it's been adapted to two other movies. I know that. Mm-hmm. Um, two short films. A 1977 TV movie and a 1997 23-minute short film, which I didn't watch. I didn't watch either of those. But there's also a band from Florida called The Rocking Horse Winner. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. A, sh- a short-lived band from 1999 to 2003 uh, featuring... A bunch of musicians from Florida, including Geronimo Gomez, Henry Olmino, Matthew Crum, (laughs) Oliver Chapoy, and Jolie Jolie Lindholm. Uh, They each have their own Wikipedia page, even though most of them were only ever in The Rocking Horse Winner. (laughs) So uh, if you're a fan of The Rocking Horse Winner, uh, what's your favorite song by them? (laughs) They put out six albums. They put Prolific. out six of them. Wait a minute. I guess some of them must be EPs. Uh, <laughs> but they did an album with Coheed and Cambria. So um, that's that's something, <laughs> I guess. They started other bands. Uh, one of them started a band that put out an album called Love Thongs. Get it? All right. Love Thongs. Uh, the, title right. Was, the title was changed to Stay Black. Um, it's a... Uh, American gothic rock and roll punk post band called Damien Dunn. (laughs) So if you're a rocking horse winner fan, listen to love thongs. Anyways, anywho, 
uh, I really liked this story. This was a really good, you know, gothic story. Yeah? Yeah. You think this qualifies? I think so. Uh, I think it has the, the language and the character archetypes and the style. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's also, I, I believe this story, I didn't know anyone who did, but I believe I, from, from some of the essays I read online, I believe that people were required to read this story in school. Uh, and I can see that it's a short story, but there's like a billion different themes to analyze. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's so much symbolism, uh, like the, the rocking horse, like what is the rocking horse? Why a rocking horse? Uh, there's all there's stuff about like the mother son relationship. There's stuff about mm-hmm. class difference, uh, parents stressing their kids out to death. Like it's just there's a lot going on here. Yep. Um, so if you're a if you're an English teacher and you're looking to teach some D.H. Lawrence, you could do worse than the Rocking Horse winner, or just play a bunch of songs by the band the Rocking Horse winner. <laughs> Love Don't songs. do that. <laughs> uh, Willow, what is our next? Dark Descent Tale. Uh, Three Days by Tanith Lee. Three Days by the amazing Tanith Lee. Uh, another woman. Another woman. I know. Like he, he's really he's really backloading the 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 women writers in this uh, in this book. I have not read Three Days uh, yet. I st- I've started it, and uh, but I I was distracted by everything else. So I'm I'm looking forward to covering this. We haven't covered Tanith Lee, so I'm looking forward to talking about her. Um, you got any uh, any any updates for the audience about your life? Uh, no, not really. Uh, Anything? I started playing a new character in one of my Pathfinder games. Awesome. You went. To <laughs> oh, the... I'm 22 now. You're 22 now. You went to the state fair. I did. You did. It was fun. Um. Yeah, you're 22. You went to the state fair. I can't believe we started this podcast when you were but a but a babe. I was like 16. You were you were you were yeah you were little yeah. So, uh, now you're not. Uh, no, <laughs> you're an old old lady, just like the rest of us. Now I'm now I'm just waiting for my books. <laughs> now you are waiting for your books. I want them uh, so bad. Uh, I am waiting for the pain in my back to go away, but it never <laughs> will because I am just a mass of aches and pains. So join us next time for the next story. We only have like a few stories left in Medusa and the Shield, by the way. Um, How many exactly? Let me find out. I'm looking at it right uh, now. Man, remember the roaches? We only have four stories left after. Well, four stories, including the next one. Yes. Three days and three more stories. And uh, then we're on to a fabulous formless darkness. Which is awesome. Which is a great a great thing to say and has some of my favorite, actual favorite short stories in it. So, like, I'm looking at, like, four of them right now I would consider among my favorite short stories. So, like, Hell of all yeah. time. Okay, out of everything. So, Hell yeah. But we'll get to those. But first, Tanith Lee's Three Days. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I guarantee you that Willow and I not only love all of our listeners, but we are actually in love with all of our listeners. Yep. That's definitely. what I say. That's what I say. Uh, listen to Deep in Bear Country. Listen to Pizza oh. Toast if you want. Um, otherwise. I have no podcasts or anything to advertise. That's Not fine. yet. Not yet. Maybe in the future. Maybe one day. Otherwise. Maybe I'll start a D&D podcast. I am Philip. And. I did that on purpose. <laughs> I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's, it's Del, Del Toro, Toro time. time. Bye. Bye. Bye.